And we're not a movie podcast at Better Buddies. Hello, and welcome back to Better Buddies. I'm your host, RJ. With us this week, it's James! Oh. Hi, James. Hi, RJ. How are you? Today? I'm good, and you? I'm, uh, I'm good as well. Uh, I, uh, yeah. You know, working hard or hardly working. <laughs> <laughs> hey! Am I right? Um, but yeah, yeah. Uh, just uh, another week in the world, you know? Our Better Buddies icebreaker this week, if you had the chance to go back 10 years and take a one terabyte hard drive with you, what data would you put on it? Oh. Oh. So this would be, let's say if it's to the day, it would be November 8th, 2012. Oh, damn. Wow. <laughs> wow. Um, I would take... I would take, I'd, I'd just, honestly, I'd pull a Biff from Back to the Future. Like, bring those election results back, bring those uh, sports t- winnings back, place the bets, make the money. <laughs> oh, that's not a bad idea. Do, are, are you ever afraid, though? Because, like, are you ever afraid, like, they never say, because he won, like, so much money from doing that. Are you ever afraid? real life that someone would like catch on to you and people would start asking questions oh they absolutely would which is why you gotta play it a little safe you gotta like space it out make good choices and you can only win just enough so you can invest once you gotta make like three to five good bets and then you're out Hmm. yeah okay i can see that yeah or like space it out by like five to seven years every time yeah, that's fair. Okay, maybe that's not like five to seven, but like three oh, years. Yeah. Win like two or three big bets in the course of a year every three years. Okay. Or that's, uh, March that's Madness hard. brackets. You just win a billion March Madness brackets. Can't you only do like one of those? I don't fucking know. <laughs> well, yeah, but it's not <laughs> a year. Like March Madness is every year, so like ten years of March Madness just go down as a legend. Oh, that's true. Oh, that's true. That's true. Either that, or I'd, uh... I'd pull a bunch of media, like, lists, and just go to creators and be like, Hi, I have your next inspiration at strategic timelines before they, like, publish the thing. Oh, like, give them the idea? Yeah. And then ask for like, royalties or rights or something? That's not a bad idea. Like, something like that? Yeah. <sighs> You're so, uh, you're so cutthroat. You're so, um... See, and it, honestly, mm. though, like, the more I think about it, it's delicate, right? Like, you gotta... Mm. You gotta do the thing without disrupting your life. It, this is true. This is true. Oh, goodness. What so would I, I think do? there'd have to be instructions. That's what's also on the terror drive. Is like, hello, RJ. This is you from the future. Here are the instructions you must follow using the data on this drive. You must still make the following choices. Oh. oh, so you exist in this past, like you, there. So it's not like um, you're just all of you just visiting this ten years. Like you still have the chance to run into yourself. I th- it's tricky. Like it's, it's up to interpretation. Either you go back, you revert to ten years ago, but you've got the hard drive. So you're like, what? We're like fifteen or whatever it is, and we're like, oh, we got this hard drive. What's on it? Plug in, and it's like. Pshew. Here is all the information for the next decade. Or okay. you go back in time with the hard drive and like you're just back in time, but you are still running around and you gotta live a decade to get back and close the loop, but you'll never close the loop because you'll be a decade older than when you left. Oh, that's like simultaneously fascinating crying. Um Wow. Well, the what, problem with what like, I closing do? time loops is you still live through that time, so like if you burn, like, five years to close the loop, and you start off at 25, you're now 30, so, like, you'll show back up to your place of work, and everybody's gonna be like, oh, man, you, what happened to you? 
and you just gotta be like, uh, I had a really rough day. <laughs> Never had one of those. Five. Feel like I aged a decade. Huh. I want to bring mm. spec scripts. Bring all those spec scripts. No one pays attention to writers. They only pay attention to directors. Oh, that's very true. I could. I could bring back some spec scripts for sure. Can you imagine sure. being the person to bring, wow. like, Avengers Endgame to Marvel in 2012 and be like, Hi, I know your plan for the next ten years. Feige, I've got something for you. <laughs> <laughs> I would ransom it to them. Oh, man. No, I think what I would do is I would bring... Um, uh, I don't really know. I'm trying to think of something that's like... What would I bring back? All what of Jake Paul's YouTube about? content. <laughs> Just cut the legs out from under him. Prevent, prevent this. Stop this from happening. Yeah. I would... Mm, I would probably bring back, gosh, I really don't know. Like, I have everything that I want. Um, let me think of something fun. That's fun. Just give yourself a bunch of video games. Or, like, thinking... movies. Not to, like, distribute, just to watch. Oh, just to watch when nobody else is. Yeah. Yeah, that could be kind of fun. I think, I think it would interesting it would be interesting to find filmmakers young filmmakers who hadn't made something yet and talk to them like just de demonstrate legitimacy and then talk to them about like what they'll do but i also don't know if that would like ruin it oh, like it you don't want to ruin anything for ever anyone you know i mean that's like, the problem with time travel though is inherently you change existence and could divert the path. I know. I think that's so, like, I don't think we're we're supposed to. In that way, almost money is sort of, I guess, depending on how it's used. But that money stuff is almost the most innocent stuff. Because at least it's just, although unless it's, like, you're taking it away and, like, from somebody who's winning it. They were going to, like, pay for somebody's hospital bills or something. Um, but, like, uh, I feel like even then, if it's, like, hi, uh, you're a stockbroker person type person, like, financial planner. Follow the instructions on this hard drive, and then give the money to this person on this day and time, so that like it's happening in the background already. Which means when you get back to the f back to your present day, it's a closed loop because like the next day you get the money. Oh, that's not bad. Like have somebody invest for you, basically. Yeah, it's like sending the. It's like in Back to the Future Three when Doc Brown sends the letter to Marty McFly after he's teleport. Like, because at the end of Back to the Future Two, Doc is hit struck by lightning and the DeLorean disappears. And then the last Pony Express guy rides up and is like, hi, are you Marty McFly? I've got a letter for you from 1886. Oh, you know what I would do? I would bring back, this is what I would do. I would bring back videos and examples of social media accounts and a bunch of stuff just from the internet that basically shows the worst effects of social media and I would bring it back and I would show it to people and I would say, do not let it get like this. That's what I would do. <laughs> I would, and I would try. You've now created Skynet. I would try. I would try my best to be like, listen, I'm not saying it's going to go one way or the other. You know, so, sometimes it just goes the way it goes. This is what this all turns into um, in 10 years. Uh, if you want to go down that path, if you want to keep going or you don't want to believe me, uh, absolutely feel free. Absolutely. That's your, that's your, uh, right as a human being. If you don't, uh, close the computer, turn off the phone, go outside or just do something different. Not to be like that guy, but that's plenty, that's at least part of what I would do. I'd be like, don't, whatever you do, don't let people care too much about social media because it's going to. It's going to mess a lot of stuff Don't up. Don't fuck with the algorithms. Don't do it. Don't. I know it seems awesome. You're on that goal. You're on that peak right now. It, it's going to start to tip. And you do not want that. Just leave There's it where it is. There's a man named Elon Musk. 
He's going to buy Twitter. <laughs> Listen, all right. <laughs> I I think um I don't know what to think about Elon Musk. I'm pretty neutral on him to be honest. He he seems to me like he is just he's kind of like a quieter guy who's a bit of like a quiet narcissist, but in somewhat of a naive quiet. way. Would well like you know what I mean? Like he's not he's not like he doesn't have the raw charisma of like like he's not he's not one of these like major powerhouse narcissists like yeah. Trump or like Kanye, you know, he's very he's the he's like the nerdy version of that. So he's a little bit more dialed back, but he still has tendencies of it. He just reads to me as a kid who just really wants attention. And oh, yeah. Not in a way that's like totally, I don't think, I know a lot of stuff gets ascribed to him. He doesn't read to me as like belligerent or anything, but he does come off as like, he's just doing a lot of this stuff for attention. But okay, this, we're think, talking about a guy who tried to set his uh, Tesla stock to be valued at $420. <laughs> I like, I don't know. There's a part of me where it's like, that is like conceptually, it's the lowest kind of like. I mean, it's like haha, four twenty. Conceptually, it's it's funny or comedic because almost because of that, because it's so dumb, like it kind of wraps back in on itself and becomes genuinely funny, or like at least has elements of it. Yeah, but I don't know. I I did think him buying Twitter was. I didn't even think that deal was going through anymore. So when I saw oh, it, like no, a that was the problem. It, he was like he was gonna buy Twitter, did all the paperwork, and was gonna buy it for some stupid meme sum, and then he was like, "Oh wait, I don't actually want this. I was joking. I don't actually want this. this is no, no." And then the courts were like, "Um, you filled out the paperwork. You're gonna buy it." Dang, that's funny. That's really funny. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, like these are legally binding papers, sir. You can't just not do this. I was talking to a couple people about this. I was talking to my actually. I was talking to my family about this. I do think it's interesting because now he effectively, like, I think Twitter right now in social media is the most currently not just on social media but debatably online is the most mainstream, like, widespread form of rapid information dissemination online. Yeah. Like, Facebook used to fulfill that no longer, though. Instagram is more of just a slow sort of... It's like Facebook for our generation. YouTube kind of, but it doesn't have that immediacy of Twitter. TikTok is more entertainment, even though a lot of people do. It's massive. Like, Twitter is a very unique animal, and it's one that, like, a lot of modern discourse is, like, dependent on. And now he has his hand, like, right on the faucet. I think it's fascinating. And I um, think it's going to die. I it honestly I don't think it would be the worst thing if that site died. I think it would no. be sad. Um for the same reason that I honestly don't think it would be sad if like 4chan or Reddit died. Like I don't think it would be it wouldn't it would be a loss in terms of like something like that is gone. You know what I um, want? Let's just go back to forums. Like individualized website forums. Oh yeah. Yeah. I've stumbled. Have you ever stumbled across one? Like, I've found a few. Um, um, I've found a... I know, like, Halo. Halo Cosplay has its own forum website. Okay. And I found... I've gone to that for a couple, like, 3D print models. Um, <laughs> I've. It's been a while since I've stumbled across, like, a genuine, like, hey, this is a unique thing. I, I found so one... So much by fandom. Yeah, I, I found one a couple summers ago, like one in the, I think it was the summer of 20, it was the summer of 2021, it was like June of 2021, uh, and I, I found it, and I was a completely, it was completely by accident, and I was on, I used it for like a solid week, uh, I was pretty active on it for a little bit, and I eventually drifted away from it. But I, it was the first time, it was like a little home-built website, I mean run by just like a little group of people and like an audience that started to grow and had these communities that came and went. It wasn't geared towards any specific sort of, uh, like you're saying, like a fandom or a niche. It was just sort of 
an internet forum. And it was the first of its kind that I had encountered in my own time. And I was like, wow, this is really, really cool. I really like this. Um, I do want to clarify, Fandom is actually a company. Like, a lot of the wikis oh. are owned by Fandom. Oh, you mean the site, not the thing. Okay, yeah. okay. I see what you mean. Okay, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's actually I a little just... bit of a problem. Is like, the Legend of Zelda wiki, a lot of the people, when it got bought up by Fandom, jumped ship to make a new wiki because they just didn't want to deal with, like, Fandom inserting a bunch of ads into it. Yeah, I think that's completely fair. I mean, I, if you ask me, uh, this is my... You, you want to hear my big sociological prediction this is this is this is james putting putting on his uh his big his yeah his tinfoil prophecy cap is what what we'll say i think over the next century perhaps idealistic this is what i could see happening though i think both online and in the real world uh the populations are slowly going to drift from the, f- the focus of the populations as well is going to slowly drift from these major centers and hubs of, I- of, of information or like, like life. So cities or major websites, and it's going to slowly, those things will still exist, but it's going to slowly drift back to like, people are going to focus inward on their own communities. And I think in time, like smaller communities are going to take more of a prominence uh, in our public life. And I I also think that they're going to potentially give birth to like another sort of like form of like the social structure we're living in today. That's what I think. So I hope so too. I really do. Um, I mean, I really really do. Yeah. It follows the ebb and flow though of like, Industrial Revolution already surged into the cities, and then Manifest Destiny, they surged right back out. Mm-hmm. I think we're experiencing sort of, um, I don't know what I would call it. There's a lot of words for it. I'll just say, like, civilization fatigue. Like, I, I yeah. think, like, a lot of people are just sort of done. Well, that was a, that was a great icebreaker question. We got a lot out of that one. Yeah, we did. Nice. Our next segment is Better Buddies Recommend, where we recommend a piece of media to enjoy. What you got for us this week? Okay, so I just started this today. Okay. It's something I've wanted to read for a while. It is a book. Technically a pamphlet, but it's in book <gasps> form. And it is Common Sense by Thomas Paine. Ooh. Uh, so, really quick for anyone who does not know, who might not know, uh, Common Sense was a pamphlet that was written and published in 1776 by a... This guy apparently had a lot of jobs. He was a lot of stuff in England from, like, a laborer to, like, a seamstress-type guy to, like, a political campaigner. And he eventually came to the United States, and he started writing political pamphlets pamphlets for the then burgeoning and somewhat still underground American Revolution. And his name was Thomas Paine. He wrote, like, a few hundred of them, didn't he? He wrote... A lot. I did not know that he wrote so many pamphlets. Um, he wrote a lot. Like, I don't know about a few hundred, but I do know that he wrote quite a few. He, he from, after being known from a common sense on, he, like, that was basically all he did was write political pamphlet. Um, so, common sense is basically Thomas Paine at the, at, at the time the the United States, uh, they weren't the United States. The colonists. So can I interject were... real quick? Yeah, yeah, of course. I'm just picturing like the group of leaders in the state, the colonies, like going like, "All right, we, how are we gonna win? We we gotta push back against Britain. How are we gonna do this?" And Payne just stands up in the back, pamphlets, and <laughs> Ben Franklin's got like his fingers at the bridge of his nose, like Thomas, Thomas. We talked about the pamphlets. We need more than so- pamphlets. But I got pictures. <laughs> I got pictures in here. <laughs> Thomas. It's great. But we need, like, guns. <laughs> we need a plan. <laughs> Look. We gotta over... We got like... See, Revere over here had the great idea to throw the tea in the harbor. That's an action. That's a statement. King George is not gonna read your pamphlet. We can make a pamphlet about that. Thomas. <laughs> 
I'm just, I, this is all I can do. I can't do anything. I, that, that, I'm sorry, all right? I, and would you please fine. give back my printing press? Fine. All right. Yeah, sure. <laughs> sure. I write one of the greatest pamphlets of all time. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so no, actually, start of the revolution, he, underground. He yeah. after, he got known after Common Sense. He did, um, and it, it was really seminal because basically, at, at this time, uh, the revolution was not the revolution. The revolution was ba- the the colonists did not view this as like a big championship of independence and liberty. They viewed it as them still being English citizens rather than seeking independence. They just they they were basically negotiating for a better better treatment still under the crown. But Thomas Paine came along and he sort of saw in this moment a real, genuine potential for significant change, not just in the country, but in the world. And he put this down in common sense. And basically, like, again, I haven't read the whole thing, but obviously from school, I know, like, he basically made the argument that 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 the American colonies had an opportunity to overthrow what had become a tyrannical power and by doing so not only establish themselves as free and an independent colony a free and independent nation but they had the chance to demonstrate that people could choose of their own free will their own government and and build it themselves uh and this is something that, uh, like, even a lot of the founding fathers found like a very radical sentiment. Um, John Adams, notably, was like not a super huge fan of uh, oh. of common sense. He did not think that Paine had a very good view of government, uh, and he thought that the pamphlet itself would lend to sort of a dangerous radical, almost like it sounds like a radical individualism or giving too much power to the people overall. What I will say is that I really enjoy uh, so far what I've read, and I've only read a little bit of it. His language is very energetic. It's very persuasive um, for what I would almost call uh, an academic, quote unquote, style of writing, something that isn't fictional. It's your non-fictional style of writing. It's incredibly colorful in a way. It's very vibrant. Um, And he does make... A lot of good points in very quick succession. Uh, do you mind if I just read like I go one? For it. Bit? Um, there's one bit like right out of the be- right out of the gate that he says that I I really really love. Um, so he basically like he makes a distinction right off right out of the gate between society, basically just a gather a community of people. Um, which he says is a blessing, and government, which he says is at best a necessary evil. Society promotes social good. Government is supposed to negate uh, our lesser instincts. Um, So he says uh, society in every state is a blessing, but government, even in its best state, is but a necessary evil. In its worst state, an intolerable one. For when we suffer or are exposed to the same miseries government, which we might expect in a country without government, our calamity is heightened by reflecting that we furnish the means by which we suffer. And I think that's amazing because he's basically saying, like, it sucks when you live under a government that sucks because you in some ways feel responsible for it sucking and you know that it could be better. Uh, So... I don't know. I would suggest common sense. I know like this stuff isn't everybody's cup of tea. Ha ha. Uh, but I <laughs> would, say that, uh, because it's, it, it time and time again, reading stuff from this like revolutionary era or the stuff that fueled it, you really kind of see what these people were going for. And it was not a government. It wasn't, it was a country like governed by people and laws not by a government. So I would suggest Thomas Paine's Common Sense. Nice. That's correct. Mm-hmm. What do you got? I'm going to recommend Everything Everywhere All at Once because the only other thing I've done for the last two weeks is play Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Ah, all right. Okay, so you are recommending Everything, everything everywhere. everywhere All at Once. What did you think of it? 
Uh, spoiler alerts incoming for everything everywhere all at once. If you haven't seen it mm-hmm. and want to be unspoiled, skip ahead. Um, I really enjoyed it. It was very well done. Um, I was surprised to find out at the end that it was the Russo brothers that directed. I didn't realize that. Um, was it? Yeah, it was the Russo brothers. Oh, there's no way. I'm serious. I'm almost certain. Hang on. No, it, it, they might have produced it. They I, produced. It, I, I believe. They, yeah, I believe the director is Daniel Kwan. It says Daniel Kwan and Daniel Scheinert. Um, they're the second most commercially successful directors of all time, only behind Steven Spielberg. The Russo brothers. Yeah. Um, I mean that. Oh, yep. Yeah, sorry, they okay. were only producers. They were only producers. That was a. Uh, they were also only producers on 21 Bridges, which I didn't realize, but uh, everything ever all at once. I like the cast. The cast was really good. I liked the way they did the multiverse. I thought that was a really fun way they did that. And, like, their explanation for uh, how to do, like, skills and abilities and stuff. And, like, tap into it. Mm-hmm. I... Something about it was just a little... I don't know. Like, I think, I think I needed a little bit more from the husband on his, like, being nice to everybody. Mm -hmm. Or, like, more demonstration of how his niceness was actually beneficial, that she just didn't see it. Because, like, the climax of the movie is there's the big fight scene that's gonna go down, and... The main character's like, oh, I'm going to fight your way. And then she does nice things to everybody who's standing in her way that gets them out of her way. Which was really fun and a really cool, like, subversion. But it was also kind of like, we saw him be nice. Like, he was generally nice but ineffective at all the prior stuff. And then we got one scene of how his being nice did something beneficial. And then it was like, ah, oh, yeah, I'm going to do things your way. It's like, could you, I, I wanted, like, one more scene. She doesn't have, she didn't have to be there to, like, see it. But give me one more scene where he's, like, says a nice thing or does a nice thing or does something goofy that helps the family out. I see. I see. I think that's fair. But, oh, and I also fucking hated the hot dog fingers thing like hated it like in the movie because it was gross or hated it just like all around i i think i probably would have been fine with it if not for the whole like eating their fingers and ketchup and mustard coming out of nowhere Mm -hmm. like why i didn't i didn't i didn't find it i think it's me being a little like stuck up or whatever i didn't find it as i found it i found it like a little too goofy like i found it like a little you like ah that's i guess like, you know i think part of it too is they didn't take it far enough right like mm-hmm. okay let's take this to its logical conclusions in a species where their fingers are all long and floppy and useless how have they developed and evolved societally to still function because everything else in the world is the same and it's like oh no we can't play piano we can't open doors but we got really good with our feet. And it's like, okay, so we'll... That means then, like, doors should be develop- designed and developed that you can open them from the bottom with your foot. Mm-hmm. For easy access. Or, like, a piano should be way lower on the ground. No, that's uh, that's a very fair point. Like, I guess... and Because obviously, like, the whole joke is just that it's supposed to be so out of place. And anyone, because it's like the whole multiverse could make the argument oh well that's just the multiverse that's that's the multiverse where everything is the same except for their you know their fingers or whatever uh which i which i can understand because it's supposed to be taken almost conceptually but i also agree where it's like i think not following through um does kind of like defeat almost what could be an even better joke you know yeah, and I, again, part of my thing goes back to the, like, hot dogs for fingers is weird, but makes sense. Like, they set it up of, like, oh, in this battle, 
a gorilla with hot dog fingers defeats another ape and becomes the dominant species. Okay, fine. But they don't set up any aspect of the, like, ketchup mustard coming out of nowhere. Like, why is that happening? Why? Why does it happen, James? It, you know, it's, it's, that's, uh... It's just wrong. It's what they believe, you know? That's what's in their body. Uh, I don't know, I, I, I liked, I will say, like, I liked the movie. I did. Um, I feel like, I don't know, this is one that's very, like, hard to critique. Um... When I was initially, like, for the first opening 15 to 20 minutes, I was like, oh, this is interesting. So they're really going to try and go with this, like, whole structure, and then they're going to play with that. And then when it broke that structure, because it it starts to get set up almost like a very traditional hero's journey narrative, where she's down on her luck, she's having all this stuff pile up, and her relationships are falling apart, and then she has this sort of like catalyzing moment. She has a lot of this exposition delivered by somebody who's from this other place that she doesn't understand, but is getting sucked into. So it's very traditional. And then it completely diverges from that, which I understand is like two degree. That's sort of the point of the film, but it felt like very uh, scatter scatterbrained. And I know really? that almost the point it, it did. I, I know the point of the movie is like no character um, like, oh, you know, at the same, we're everything all at the same time, no matter what. And yet we're still us. And that is sort of some of the emotional grounding when you get to those scenes where it is just like her and her daughter again. And the idea that these, or even just her and her family and the idea that these people have been everywhere and anything they could possibly be, and yet they're still them. And and there's a sense of real grounding that comes through that sort of um, reconnection after such like a tribulation. There's something to me though that it felt a little it it just felt a little too into its own concept to land. And I don't know how you do that because like a movie like that begs to almost be sort of schizophrenic and wall to wall and sort of completely jarring and disconnected because that's the essence of its subject material. So I think it could just be a personal thing for me. Yeah. Um, I think part, I don't, I never got quite like disconnected from it because I, I've always looked at more of the, like the story is the mom coming around to accept the daughter's like whole thing. Mm-hmm. and listening to her. It did bug me in the end fight, though, with all the, like, costumes and robot and everything, where it's like, what, what, no, I thought, I thought these were the people in our universe, in this universe, just, like, being hijacked. Like, how did, how the, where did the military gear come from? Where did the, where did the robot wheelchair come from? I think I think that's the thing too is it it tried to have I'm sure if I rewatched it a few times like I would detect a running story and an architecture but overall it it felt like it couldn't decide if it wanted to be a like a a more traditionally structured movie that kind of contained this sort of like antimatter of of like chaos in it or if it wanted to just be this like completely wild and out totally broken out like film it couldn't seem to decide that and it felt a little confused and again i get that that to agree is maybe just a byproduct of how the film is and its subject matter but i do feel like it could have been done a little bit a little bit more i liked some of the amateur quality to it i love that scene where it's um the two rocks like on the oh, cliff yeah. i thought that was great that was great i, I really like that i like those little genuine amateur touches that feel like they have a, at least have like a grounding in something. Cause that also seems to be a part of the message of the film is that we go through all these things, but in a way, like it's our relationships that ground us. And it's, it's not just who we are. That means something, but who we are in the light of another person's eyes. And I suppose her being disconnected from so many people lends to a certain feeling of like confusion and chaos. I guess I wanted to feel that a little more and maybe I should rewatch it, but I I did like it. I thought I was like, wow, you know, it's a very inventive 
creative movie. It's not big budget. It's I love the fight choreography. I thought there were some really great bits. I I think um, uh, Margaret Margaret Cho is that her name? She did fantastic. Yeah. I think that's her name. Um, I uh, um, see. And yeah. I kind of as much as I like the way they did the multiverse stuff, I kind of wish it'd been more about like also reset oh points God. of oh God, it's Margaret like, Cho. I feel so bad. What? On. It's not Morgan Show. I'm an asshole. Oh. What is? Who is she? Um, Michelle Yo. There it is. It's Michelle Yo. She was great. She was really, really good. So like, I kind of wanted it to because I didn't know how it was gonna work. So going in when like the first fight scene, fight scene happens where he unwinds the chapstick and eats it, mm-hmm. having come right off of the one where he's like, oh, when you get off the elevator, imagine like do these things and imagine you turned into the broom closet rather than went inside of the desk. So. I was expecting to be like, oh, it's a reset point. You do the weird thing, and every time it, re- like, if you lose, you just reset to that one point and do something differently weird to just keep making new, like, split realities to find your reset mm-hmm. point. But that's, like, not it at all. No. It's just, like, the thing, too, is, like, it has all these rules, and then it breaks them, which, again, like, I, yeah. I like that in in concept. It's just sort of something that uh it is really difficult to sort of like well for me it looped back around to the one fight later on where like the two people trying to stop her from like reaching the same power level as her daughter are obsessed with Mm -hmm. putting things up their butt which like was funny but also in trying to make the leap to shove something up your butt you've done the weird thing this should launch pad you like it's the decision to do so not the act of doing I guess like does does the is the decision not contingent on the action? Is a decision nothing like is a decision anything without its corresponding action? Sorry, repeat that. I said is like I like is a decision really anything without its corresponding action? Do you not need both to create um that thing? Well it's attempt, right? Like if you make the decision to I, I guess it becomes a question of like doing the weird thing versus the outcome of doing the weird thing. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm going to try and shove a golf ball in my ear randomly, and if you're pushing the golf ball against your ear, you've made the decision, you've done the weird thing that's out of what a normal choice would be. Mm-hmm. So, I see. theoretically, that should be enough of a springboard, because, like, that's part of it, too, is the, like, oh, you need to sincerely say that you love her, that she is love, which is, like, Okay, I can see how that's like doing the thing, right? Like you gotta hit the outcome, but mm-hmm. I, I don't know. It just stuck to me. Well, then especially like I, once you've made the decision, you've got the like mindset there. Why did you need to leave the things shoved up your butt? I've actually, I've actually been thinking really quick. Like I think your your hot dog finger example is actually a really good micro thesis on. Maybe some of the, some of the, maybe some of like the the quote structural issues with the film, because it's like, to me, it's like, it's, it's weird, but it's not weird enough. It's weird in a way where it's like, oh, that's weird, but it's not, it doesn't feel all the way thought through and it feels only strange enough to be strange in a palatable way, not strange in a truly strange way. I didn't feel unnerved. I didn't feel like I was seeing something completely new in a sense. I just felt in a way overwhelmed. Uh, I, again, I, I hate, like, I hate to do this because I, I like the movie. I like it for what it did. Like, I think it is in, in some ways, I would almost say like a landmark film in popular cinema. Yeah. But I do think like it being lauded as like highly original and breaking all these things, like in some ways, yes, but not in the actual, in my, in my uh, perception and my interpretation, not in the way it, like you kind of point out, it doesn't exercise it to the fullest degree. And therefore it falls by definition a little bit. I think I figured it out. Okay. Everything everywhere all at once is to the multiverse what Back to the Future is to time travel. 
Okay. All right. That's not bad. Okay. I can see that for sure. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Like a fun spin on the, the idea or the concept without it being sort of a one that feels the need to go fully into every ramification or iteration to it. Cause also again, cause like similar to back to the future, it's got a fun story, fun time. We love doc and Marty. We love their shenanigans. But a lot of people point out the, like, time travel plot holes and, like, why didn't this happen? Why didn't you do this? What's this option? And, like, I think an example of that Mm -hmm. in the movie is the Alpha universe keeps crossing over into hers. And one of the reasons she gets picked is it's like, oh, no, you're such a loser that you had so many possibilities available to you in life, but you didn't do any of them. So you have infinite universe to do. But it's like, hang on. Theoretically, you can jump into any thing connect any of them just by doing the right action so it shouldn't matter which one you pick beyond the like personable aspect of the like connecting with her daughter at the end like that's the only reason that's there but that's not the reason he gives combined on top of that like alpha universe it's like oh yeah the what do they call her again the the gym oh the word for her yeah like the villain Oh, the villain ravaged our our reality and then left to all these other ones. It's like, wait a minute. If it's so ravaged, how... And, like, this whole jumping thing is something that had to be learned. How are there enough people left to do it that... Grand, like, dad... Her dad has, like, an entire army of people who are agents trying to do this. Like, there should be... This should be post-apocalyptic levels of no one's left alive. Like, we're three people in a van with some scavenged equipment, constantly driving so that we're never found, and there's no one left around. Wait, sorry, wind that back one more time? What are you saying? So, in the in the Alphaverse, Alpha, uh, yeah. what's his name, shows up and is like, oh yeah, in, our, in my universe she like killed all the cows and killed a lot of people and ruined things and then kind of dipped to go like off on the rest of the multiverse and do her evil plot. I was like, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. If she did that, you should be like, you and the people in the van, and that's it. How does Grandpa have a small army of Mm -hmm. people who are trained to do this thing when they explicitly said, like, oh yeah, once we connected the multiverse, we started training people to jump into the multiverse and do the multiverse stuff. And, like, you'd think those would be the first people to be killed. Oh, because they'd be found out, like, immediately. Yeah, like, if you're a multiversal entity out to destroy the multiverse, the one thing you would want to do is destroy anybody else who has the power to stop you. Yeah, that's very... Isn't it... To to be fair, though, don't they, like, make... Don't they talk about how they're, like, they're training to, like, avoid her that they, like, have... Although... Do they even talk ever about being able to avoid detection? Or or do they just talk about being able to jump? They don't necessarily talk about... Uh, they kind of do. It's more of a, like, hey, don't get noticed. Like, Mm -hmm. don't draw draw attention. So, like, he does his jumps very carefully and, like, shields himself from the cameras and stuff to hide the fact that he's there in that universe, even though he's the Alpha. And then they've got the van that's constantly driving. So, and he, like, makes it a point to try and not do weird things, to not get noticed, to not cause a scene, to not draw attention to himself. But that also means that, like, what in the world... It, but, again, the dad in the wheelchair is, like, he's got a bunch of agents who are trained on how to do these multiversal jumps. And it's like, mm-hmm. if you've got these agents, what is... How? Yeah, like, how has this not... Like, you should have been found immediately. Well, especially because she's, she's, like, regarded as this, like, immensely, like, powerful entity and one who would like kind of like you're pointing out like would probably know or have a way to know or at least feel that people are like coming in and out when they're not supposed to be if at all and especially because part of the thing is like she was trained up by her mom so she knows the training happens she was the prime she was their top successful candidate so she knows there's an entire whole group of people that were being trained alongside her (laughs) I, like, and that's my thing, too, is, like, I think that, 
like I, th- I think you're back to the future comparison is yeah. apt, which is why I think like I think this movie again, I think it's good. I think it's fun, but I think there's like a level of reverence that I saw with it that is not commensurate with like the substance of its material. Um, I'm not saying you can't enjoy it. Like I'm not saying that. I think you should. Again, I really um, enjoyed it. But like, I thought the acting. I was do great. remember. There are some people who are like, I, I like, they're like, oh, it's mind blowing, or it's like, oh, it's so different and unique, and it's like, I like again, I guess in the way that yeah, Back to the Future was like different and unique, and it was groundbreaking for its time, and I would say that this is to a degree like groundbreaking in its time for the scope it's more sort of like a structural or from a a story accomplishment level a technical achievement of what this movie was able to do with its story at the size that it is rather than what the actual like substance of the movie is which like is an achievement but i don't think it's an achievement that is like warranting some of the accolades that it's gotten because it's like yeah it's like it's good it's it's got it's a really nice car that was built for very like for relatively cheap compared to other cars that are just that are just like it and it does basically the same thing it's really sweet doesn't have a really great engine though doesn't really go as much as you want it to um you can drive it around but it's missing that oomph you know um i also want more googly eyes (laughs) <laughs> i did like the googly eyes i, I, I like the eyes, and like the dvd box made it seem like oh there's gonna be googly eyes it's a thing mm-hmm. like that's the mark Everywhere. of like i'm doing the multiversal stuff is put a googly eye in my forehead and like open my third eye and it's like no no it's gonna be the end of five minutes where you do that as a sign of being goofy yeah, I liked, I, no, I, I agree. I thought it was going to be a little more prevalent. I even think maybe, if, like, um, I don't, oh, wait, yeah, wasn't her husband putting that on stuff? Um, yeah, it's early that on in the movie. Bit? He, like, put it on, like, laundry bags and washers and that kind of stuff to, like, to make it happier and cheerier. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, like, that's a nice little touch. Maybe I should rewatch this film and kind of see what I actually think about it. I, I haven't seen it since I watched it in theaters. Uh, but, I mean, did you have any, like, standout performances for you that, like, really, oh, you really like? Um, I thought, uh, could, who was it that was the lead actress? You just said Michelle it. Yeoh. Michelle Yeoh, yeah. I thought Michelle Yeoh did amazing in it. I thought she did really well with the role she had of finding the, like, uh, the heartbreaking point, right, where, like, she's got the moment to tell her daughter how she really feels when her daughter's about to leave, and instead just tells her not to eat so much. And there's the, the heaviness of, like, the responsibility and the trying, like, all the stuff at the beginning where, with the tax stuff, and then the stuff at the end where it's like the emotional breakthroughs. I thought Michelle Yeoh did amazing with that. I liked the guy who played her, like all the performances I thought were spot on. Mm -hmm. It's just some of the like story stuff that kind of came, some of the mechanical stuff, I guess I should say. Because the story overall I thought was really well done as a story. It's just Mm -hmm. the, like we discussed, the mechanics didn't quite reach. Yeah, I think it's, I think, I think you're right. I think the acting kind of like saves this movie. Which again um, goes back to the Back to the Future where like they all had great actors and great roles and a great script with like the dialogue but then they had the like weird plot hole of like why is this high schooler hanging out with a 60 year old scientist? Yeah, that's very true. It, it's got some stuff that people overlook because of its sort of like charm. That's the thing, though, too, is like Back to the Future is a very structurally driven movie. Like it's about something that is that is like reality bending, but it has its own sort of it's got a pattern to it that you can sort of like lash onto, And it does do some things that are like a little bit different, but it's kind of packaged in sort of a um i shouldn't even say packaged it's it's sort of uh designed in a very in a very familiar way and yet it feels very like fresh it feels like 
a genuinely classic take on a new subject. I don't know if this movie feels like that. This movie feels like an attempt to do something new, but in doing kind of done what other movies have done, who've tried to do something new while ignoring some of the more staples of presentation that you might need. I don't know though. I feel like I'm feeling like I'm sounding like really pretentious and yeah, I'm missing. And I, I was thinking that as point. well, like of my own criticism, like we've talked a lot about the things that didn't really work for us, but I feel like that glosses over a lot of stuff that really did work well of like, again, it's, going back yeah. to the first multiversal fight scene where he's fighting with the fanny pack. And, like, that great moment where he reaches over behind into the fish tank and takes the rocks out, and he puts the rocks into the fanny pack and proceeds to kick ass. Or when the villain first shows up and, like, the fight scene is stopped by the cops and then destroys the cops with the multiversal rearranging of Mm -hmm. puts him in the dancing outfit and turns him into a piñata and beats the shit out of him with dildos. Like... Or the couch, when later on in the movie, when the two of them are up in the apartment, and she's like, come on, try and punch me. And Michelle Yeoh's character punches her, and it does the flip between all the, like, different options there. It's like, a punch, and a kick, and a hug, and a singing, and, like, all the weird stuff, and then it goes back. And they're like, okay. Or one of the things I really liked after that was when they go to sit on the couch, is the symbology of, no, no, don't sit on the cushions, sit between the cushions. Just like they're stuck oh, between yeah. all the worlds, sit between the cushions, don't make a choice. No, there are, you're right, there are those, yeah, it's got a lot, got a lot of strong points. I love that ending set piece, I think it's great. I think um, her having a third eye that's googly eye is actually like a brilliant little icon, like a brilliant little piece of art. I think I that's also actually really amazing. like the everything bagel idea. It's literally an everything I mean, bagel. I, I love, I do think, here's what I will say, as a, we'll say, because I think maybe this is really what it's supposed to be to a degree, and, and I, you know what, I shouldn't even say anything like that. I think, it, like, you could read it as almost um, an expressionist work, right, just about uh, a mother's relationship with her, with her daughter, and that's, that's the whole grounding, yeah, really, of the film, but that means that, like, no, everything else is, like, there is because of its expressionistic, uh, it's more grounded in emotion and expressing that rather than logic. So there is no so any critique that tries to cement like a logical basis, like well, technically this doesn't work, or mechanically speaking, or like from a story structure standpoint, like all of that is sort of out the window. And really, to a degree, what it is, it's supposed to mimic the confusion, or I should say, express. That confusion, that chaos, you know, starting out from a point of relative structure, a.k.a. the base relationship, which then as, you know, it goes on, devolves into somewhat of a, of a chaotic, a complete mess to a degree where nothing really makes any sense. And you have all these moments flying in at you, you know, in and out. And I think especially like the, the, the teenage, the teenage daughter, I apologize, I don't know her name. She was great. She was really fun to watch. I yeah. think too, just yeah. as a, a metaphor for like that really we kind of laugh it off, but sometimes that very much like all consuming teenage cynicism and nihilism that can really take hold of even, you know, people who aren't teenagers is something that's like really prevalent um and has been for a long time, but really prevalent I think with a lot of people sometimes today and and that's where maybe a lot of people connected with this is they were able to feel like wow like yeah i felt like that before like i you know it's not even just that nothing is anything it's just that there's so much of everything all the time that how am i even supposed to process this you know i think a great parallel to that is literally the current streaming wars there's so much content production that how do we process the consumption of it it's definitely a great little like micro example of it for sure. It's just like you have all this stuff thrown at you and yeah, how how are you supposed to process it? Like how are you feasibly, even just in your life, you have all this stuff thrown Which at you. I think ties back in really nicely to the whole like when she's like, I'm going to fight your way and all the mm-hmm. niceness and the kindness and the goofiness and the like all those kinds of things being like, yeah. There is a lot of everything. There's a lot of life and it can be overwhelming 
to consider how much life we have left and everything that is in life and everything we should be experiencing and we're told we need to experience and everything we won't experience. And then to remember, like, yeah, but the simple, fun, goofy stuff is really why life is worth living. It's not all the stuff to do. It's not all the stuff people tell us we have to do. It's the stuff that brings us joy and brings joy to other people's lives. Yeah, it's these simple expressions of love that, like you say, like bring that joy that makes life worth living. See, now I just remembered another one of the scenes that I think actually like could have been could have had a later payoff, and maybe it kind of did. But when they're in the laundromat at the beginning, the husband is talking to one of the customers, and is like, "Oh, you know, this guy's got dance moves. He's, like, he's dancing with him and building a good relationship with him, and like." applauding this old bearded dude's dance moves and it's like that's the that's the kind of positive stuff that's very true that's very very true yeah maybe it is a good movie maybe i'm wrong <laughs> i think it might be i should really watch this again this has yeah. really got me thinking i um, i think i think you should rewatch it again with that emotional lens rather than a logical one because I've talked myself right. around in a circle back to like applauding the movie. <laughs> I think you're right. I think I think I got to I got to give my uh I think I got to yeah, I think you're right. I mean, I did bring this up as a recommendation for a reason. Look at that. All you right. basically followed the whole path of the movie. <laughs> <laughs> All right. uh, we're just going to go to advice this week. We're just going to do some advice. Mm -hmm. Our next segment, how to be a better buddy, where we give some real and some humorous advice. What is the worst and best Halloween candy? Oh. Best Halloween candy is Twix, hands down. And I would even argue the best Halloween candy you can get is around Halloween, Twix does Twix Ghosts, which is more cookie and more caramel per bite, and it's amazing. Worst are those, like, orange and black caramel candies that nobody actually wants. Oh, I don't even know. I don't even know what you're referring to. Uh, they're literally like the most generic caramels you can get. They come in like black or orange wrappers, and it's just like, okay, this is nothing. <laughs> uh, I honestly, I'm I'm so biased because I'm gonna say this for every holiday. Uh oh. Uh, Reese's peanut butter cups, like you the little bitch. tin. Show. Dude, those are the those are the best. Those are the best candy. Some of the, like the best candy at any point in time. Reese's um, pieces for life. Reese's pieces, oh uh, son. Mm -mm. You gotta give me some of those peanut butter cups. Fuck, Man. I can eat so many of those. So many. So what's the worst? Uh, the worst. The worst to me is like um uh I I want to say like Mr. Goodbar. I remember not liking those as a kid. Oh yeah. Uh, I remember like seeing those and it's like I'll eat it, but I probably won't like it. There's another one that's like similar to they're kind of like skinnier fruity tootsie rolls, but I can't really remember what they're called. Um, um. Oh goodness, I can't. I can't remember. I don't know. But yeah, probably so best for me Reese's Reese's peanut butter cups. But like, I'm thinking like not the not the ones that necessarily come in the longer orange pack. I'm thinking like the the tin foil wrapped ones. Uh, and then worst is yeah, is probably like a Mister Good Bar. All right. Our next question: If someone blocked you on a platform, would you try to reach out on another platform? Why or why not? Further details. For example, you're in the middle of an argument on, say, Facebook, they get mad and block you, but you have their phone number or something. Do you reach out because you feel like you're not done, or do you leave them alone? With the edit, sorry if that wasn't clear, I'm not the one who was blocked, I'm a woman asking for a man's perspective on getting blocked. Hmm. So the person was doing the blocking. Hmm. I mean... Uh, okay. Here's my cut and dry take. If yeah, someone go for blocks it. you, the conversation is over. Do not go start it up on something else. 
they're done. I I would add the caveat of unless you you are genuinely for whatever reason, if you're genuinely reaching out to apologize, and that apology is not this attempt to bridge or restart the conversation. If it is a, it, this is maybe contextual, but if it's very specific, if you're like, it's got to be sincere. Yeah, it should be sincere, and by sincere, I mean like you are not writing this apology with the explicit or even the little secret hope that they are going to message you back or even see the message. You are doing this like because you genuinely feel like repentant and sorry. And you can't so, put a back door like, by the way, I was right. No, no, that doesn't. Yeah, that that's like so far out of the question. Absolutely. Yeah. So that is like the one thing I would say. But I, I like 99% of the time, I'm going to go with what you're saying on this, where it's like, if you're blocked, it's like, take it. That I mean... Take your licks. Yeah, seriously. Doesn't matter how right you are, you, in trying to be right, did more damage than probably help. Yeah, just, you know, it's over. That's it. You tried. You did. <laughs> but uh in trying stop trying yeah it's like very Taoist you know the only real action is in action our next question what do you do when you notice you are no longer that funny guy you used to be till last week so you don't think you're funny anymore is that what this question is asking I, I can read it two ways one either you're not funny anymore or two you notice you're no longer that funny guy you used to be till last week when you became funny again. Oh, wow. Those are very different. Hmm. You're, hmm. You're, you're no longer the funny guy you used to be until last week when you got funny again. Well, I guess in the first case, you're probably just growing up and you're going through a phase, a cycle. I would also posit and... were you really that funny before? For case in point, the early thousands were filled with people saying dark, edgy things, thinking they were being funny, and then going, ooh, yeah, that really wasn't that funny. It's true. That is true. Yeah, I would, yeah, I I would say, yeah, you're growing up, you're going through a phase, you just left a phase, you're going through another one, the more self-examinatory uh, phase, uh, and uh, that's all right. That's that's natural. That happens. It happens more than you would think. I would also ask, yeah. do you mm -hmm. are do you no longer think you're the funny guy because no one else is laughing, or because you're not laughing and you're not making jokes? Oh, that's very complex. I'll be honest. There are plenty of jokes I make that don't land, but I think they're hilarious. <laughs> Me too, dude. Me too. <laughs> Don't worry, we'll we'll get our day in the sun. Like I, I appreciate the fact that I have a couple coworkers who have a similar enough sense of humor when things are funny that there are points where I'll have to like pull them aside or lean over and like just tell them because I know not everyone in the room is gonna find it funny, but they're gonna think it's hilarious. Yeah, you gotta do what you can to spread to spread comedy. To spread the joy of laughter. And I would say I mean also, I would I would genuinely say I'm not trying to be some like Netflix comedian here. I would genuinely say like a sincerely funny person. It doesn't it doesn't really matter whether people laugh or not. That determines um, whether or not you're funny. Um, it's really just whether or not you're funny. And I think in all in being funny, there's an element to like truth i think to that so maybe you're going through a period where you're just examining what it means what, what you believe what truth? yeah your that sound corny but your truth perhaps you're going through that and uh you can look at it potentially as that period is probably going to be a little bit painful but if you're able to navigate it which many people do you may just find that you come out 
a little bit or even a lot more funny than uh, you were before. I would also posit, if your profession is comedian, you may want to consider updating your resume. No. Don't dissuade them, you know? But they gotta make money until they're funny again. That's true. This is very true. Yeah, you can always be what? What do comedians do when they're out of work? Uh, uh, waiters, waitresses, dishwashers. Um, yeah. They kill people. Buskers. Uh, you join a mob. You do that. Taxi driver. Uh, long haul trucker. Teacher. Yeah, garbage truck guy. Garbage man. Uh, custodian. Yeah. Yeah. Honestly, take take a break off. Take a break. You don't always have to be the funny guy. You can be something else. Just go do something productive for society. Yeah, exactly. And then come back and be funny. Boom, roasted. Implying comedians don't help society. They do in their own way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They do. By providing the menial labor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think all comedians, all working comedians starting the first of this year should all become garbage men. Honestly, they should get. Yeah. I don't think it's necessarily the worst idea. Neither do I. Just, like, put them back in the Neither shoes of regular I. folks for a hot minute. Yeah, I, I do know, like, a lot of comedians, like, there are quite a few who've done, like, you know, they have dwarfed those before. But there are also a lot who... I, I don't think Jerry Seinfeld knows what it's like to work a hard day in the last, like, 40 I, I years. Think, I think you're probably right. I think, uh, I mean, there's not, it's, there are elements of doing that type of stuff. There's elements of show business that are tough, for sure, but, um, yeah, he's, he's no garbage man, apartment worker. Not, he's not making little rocks out of big rocks. Maybe, yeah. Jerry, maybe you should be before you die. Maybe just for one year. See what it's like. Maybe see what some people are Comedians whole lives in cars are. getting coffee is you be a barista for a day. Yeah. How about that? A, a barista at a different place or at the same place. I think Jerry Seinfeld should work at a Starbucks somewhere in New York oh, for a God. year. That would be amazing, actually. That would be great. And he's got to be treated like... Well, I guess there's no way he would be treated like a regular employee, but... To His be, name tag just says J. So he yeah, keeps getting just, to like, Hey, are you Seinfeld? I get that a lot. Yeah. Like, no, I just look like and sound like him. What's the deal with that? <laughs> <laughs> um, our last question this... Oh, wait, nope. Our second to last question this week. What percentage of news do you reckon you get from social media versus direct platforms? Like, can I do 110%? I don't know that I get direct I, anymore. I would say, I don't know, because, like, I will, like, if I, I did it uh, earlier this evening, I'll, I'll just go to Google News, which I know is, like, not awesome. But it is, like, a curation from all around the web. And granted, it's, like, tailored to you to a degree. Yeah. It's not incredibly accurate. Honestly, you just go buy a newspaper or just don't read or watch the news. What, what's in there? What's in there that you got to know? <laughs> Who cares you know about I mean? potential World War Three when Russia invaded Ukraine? Like, yeah, I mean, that, that's, that. all, that's all external. A that's a multi-year you know, global pandemic. Minor detail. That That's you were going to figure that out whether or not you read the news. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Like chances are, right. You don't, you know. The only news you should pay attention to is your local news, all right? Buy, buy the local newspaper. Watch the local television station. Don't give the big guys a moment of your time, all right? They don't, they, they're not worth it. You're better than that. You really Societal are. shrapnelization. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, don't, don't let them turn you into fucking shrapnel, you know? No, 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 no. It, it, it's a playoff content shrapnelization where content becomes so, so hyper-specific in terms of, like, streaming and all the options available in the attention economy that similar to how you were talking about earlier where society is going to go back to like more com- like smaller communities and focused inward communities that we're going to it's going to shrapnelize instead of being one massive community it's going to shrapnelize into a bunch of little communities hmm. like news is well yes but also like you focusing on your local news will result in this as well 
Oh, that's see, that's good. I like that. I, I uh, honestly, I encourage that people invest more in your communities. And this is this is already this is so trotted out, but you know, I'll keep. I'll say it. I'll do it. Do it. Don't. Don't. Who cares? <laughs> those big. Those the. the, the they don't. I, I don't mean to be so freaking cynical, but they don't care about you. They really, honestly, don't. They say they do. Those people are so far removed from how you live. It's not even funny. They're on a different planet. All right. But your local they, newspaper. Those people live in your community. They do. They do. They're people just like you. Chances are, if you if you can write decently, or if you want to do it every day for the rest of your life, which very few people do, you could do it. You easily could. You have stuff to say. You definitely do. Be the local uh, town crier. Call out what's happening in the town today. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Start your own. Do something. You know, like there's, I don't know. There's so much more to focus on. Just think of, let's, let's think of a little analogy here uh, or a metaphor. You know, those big, the big news people, um, let's say like they all <laughs> And you want to be the little nerdle that happens after the massive turn is over with. Yeah, there you go. That's I I was I was going to say they're more like um, picture their relationship to the rest of the country is almost it would almost be like a a small island of people deciding what goes on in a very big country. Now, wouldn't that be crazy? (laughs) Wouldn't someone have to do something about that? That's what I would say. Um, James, that's just James. Metaphor. James, no, no, James. I'm, I'm just, I'm just saying metaphorically. I'm not proud of my shit speak. joke, but I don't think that's better. Metaphorically speak. Well, it's not a joke. Metaphorically speaking, that's what it feels like sometimes. Uh, but again, you know, that's my perception. Our last question this week is a woman who vapes a turnoff for you and why. With the further details, it's a turnoff for me personally, but I somewhat think it's unfair to judge someone off a habit like this. What are your thoughts? Um, Oh, this is a hard one for me. I, yeah, I'm not, like, super opposed to it, because, you know, last I knew, vapes all had, like, the flavors and they smell better and whatever. But, like, I don't want that shit in my house. You know? Like, same with any other smoke or like yeah okay fine it's just water vapor but it's still freaking nicotine content and it's still like smelling up my house so like i don't know i'm not directly opposed to it but it's got to be a real low-key thing like yeah i can't be super addicted to it yeah i it's so hard like i like quote unquote like officially quit like a couple weeks ago although i've had already as in classic fashion like a few returns but i'm really fucking working i'm not because i do think i'm sorry i hate to be a nerd and boring but it's true it's just like I, i've just found more and more i just don't feel good after doing it like it's just not worth it it really isn't like i'm not even saying in all the biological stuff, like in the terms of the healthier lungs and all that, I'm just saying even like psychologically, like it's not worth it. Spiritually, even it's not worth it. I don't think. But um, that's just that's like a, a that's a me thing. So it's not a turn off for me. In all honesty, um, it it really isn't. I I would I would. Uh, No, I I would accept you kind of like regardless. And I think for me to sort of like put my inclination, inclinations or declinations, predispositions onto you um, is judging you unfairly on a what really amounts to nothing more than a cosmetic factor. I, I think it is fair, though, like having similar life opinions and choices on this kind of thing is kind of important. And I would say that my ranking is as follows. Like, I'd say weed is the worst to me. Like, weed cigarettes are just absolutely the worst. Because they reek. They smell. I don't care that weed isn't, uh, apparently isn't bad for you. I don't care. It smells awful. I hate it. it. it cigarettes aren't better. Cigarettes smell like crap. I don't like those either. So vaping is the least offensive to me. But it's still not something I'm into. Yeah, it's... 
it's just um i mean i've done i've done all three um i can i can tell from firsthand that i don't care like i'm sorry i don't care what people say like like weed pot whatever form it comes in is not good for you it's like this whole like oh it's better than an alcohol um it's different it's definitely not better um cigarettes are my my that's that's the love i had to say goodbye to because that like uh i get like if you've never been addicted to them never if you've never enjoyed them before i should say to be fair to both sides it's very difficult to imagine enjoying them but once you have enjoyed them it's like they're very hard to give up um because sometimes they just go well with something but i still think you should probably leave them at the table because it's just it doesn't really set a good example it's like worth it in the moment but it's literally the definition of a temporary pleasure they're almost sort of like the modern ethos uh packaged right for you and then vaping is like i don't know it's it's okay it always made me feel kind of sick honestly because it's like you you never have to stop and like i don't know always made me feel like a little weird so i i yeah i wouldn't condone either just just do anything things that aren't air in your lungs yeah and to be fair to be fair rj you and i both enjoy a good drink uh, so be, I, I will acknowledge that, and that is my vice. But li- alcohol is supposed to go to the liver. That's how it gets cleansed out of our bodies. There is no such device for our lungs. Do you think if there was, like, a liver for the lungs, like, this stuff would be more acceptable? Oh, absolutely. Would you find it? Okay. That's fair. I never even thought about it like that before. Because, like, yeah, like you can still develop liver problems. Like, alcohol, you still develop liver problems. You're still poisoning yourself. It's still super easy to, like drink too much and hurt yourself seriously you can destroy your brain you can destroy other parts of your body like alcohol has plenty of health problems that come associated with it including addiction don't get me wrong Mm -hmm. and like it's not really what the liver was intended for but the function of the liver is to clean our blood and remove things and clean up the lungs have no such capacity and maybe that maybe I'm wrong in like oh the liver because it's all going into the bloodstream from the lungs that then the liver cleans it up too and I just don't know biology because I was an English major but no the the damage you do it's not irreparable if you stop like slowly but surely your lungs especially if you stop when you're a little bit younger your That's lungs what it is. will like, I just figured it out so yeah. drinking as far as I'm aware doesn't damage the stomach like in the same way that putting smoke or vape or whatever into your lungs damages the lungs i would uh, honestly i would say like i think i know for a lot of people like they'll never do it and that's a good thing um i do ascribe to an idea of like the greater the sinner the greater the saint so and i mean that only the sense of like if you're doing it right now like totally fine you can keep doing it. And I know that sounds so like ended and passive aggressive. I genuinely mean it. Like we're here to give advice, not run your life for you. Yeah. There's no, there's genuinely no judgments. Genuinely. Like, you know, um, I, I, I will say if you are able to stop, uh, cause sometimes it's just like, sometimes you just find those things in life that you can't talk your way out of. You can't logic out of, you can't even feel your way out of. You just don't do them. (laughs) And maybe for you, it's not that. Maybe for you, it's not. Maybe it's something else. But if it is that for you, and if you're able to surmount that, you will find, I don't know, you'll find you're a different person than you thought you were in, yeah, not like a super cool, fun, sexy way. But in a more grounded way that I think is, it's not, it's not quite, it's not quite enlightenment. It's yeah. You're going to, yeah, that's, um, you will transcend the human experience. Yeah. You get addicted, smoke lucky strikes for five years and then quit and you will experience enlightenment that I'm going to, you know what? I'm going to start a cigarette brand called enlightenments or fucking nirvanas some buddhas i'll call them buddhas and you'll 
The whole point is to get addicted to see if you can stop. Look at that. That's, I got to think of a different name. I'll think of a different name. I got to think of something. But yeah, Fair enough. that'll be, that'll be the, that'll be the whole point. But I wouldn't just as somebody who has done it and is currently going through like the out stage phase, like do whatever you want. I don't care. I personally don't find it a turn off. I really don't. I think I know that they're gross. I find it. I don't find vapes like cool or sexy because I think that it, it it's just not aesthetically whatever. It doesn't look good. Cigarettes are cigarettes can make you look cool. They can no. and they make you look sexy. So yes, James. they can. Bad yes, James. they can. That's the that's we the, promote the, healthy living. No well, of course we do. But for the same reason that you can look sexy, someone can look kind of hot holding like a, gl- a glass of whiskey or wine in a certain way. Someone can look sexy holding a cigarette in a certain way too. They both symbolize things that are relatively it's taboo. And holding, for that it's reason, not the cigarette itself. Yes, but it is the the act of like the. All right, we gotta wrap it, this up. Okay, I'm, I'm I think sorry. We're Twenty minutes over. <laughs> oh. I'm sorry. You have so much. All right. Thank you for joining this week. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Thank you to the band Problem of Interest for letting us use the song Living in the Moment off the album Cross Off yesterday. You can find them on iTunes and Spotify. You can find us on iTunes, Spotify, Amazon, or wherever fine podcasts are sold. We're also on social media. Our Facebook is Better Buddies. We post our meme Mondays and sometimes our icebreaker questions. You can also reach us on Messenger there. Our Twitter is at BetterBudCast. Use the hashtag BetterBuddies when you tweet about the show. And our Gmail account is BetterBuddiesCast at gmail.com. You can send us fan art, hate art, fan mail, hate mail, declarations of love and or war, icebreakers you want us to talk about, or questions you need advice on. Last but not least, be a better buddy. Hello. Hello. Oh. How goes it? It goes. How about you? Good. We're about to record, so are you would you like to stay for that? Can you stay for that? I cannot. I start work here in an hour. Unfortunately. I just saw you were on and figured I would say hi. I appreciate that. <laughs>